This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. It was middle to late April, almost 2,000 years ago. He was about 33 years old. The almond trees had blossomed pink on every corner and red poppies dotted empty spaces. You'd see an occasional shower. The weather's warm one day, chilly the next, trying to decide what season it is before summer comes to stay. Nights are cold. He was executed outside of Jerusalem about 33 AD. The charge was treason against the Romans, but the conviction was difficult to accomplish. He was, he was convicted on shady testimony and a, and a judge whose sense of justice rocked back and forth on politics. I've come to tell the story of the most significant death in all history, the execution of Jesus Christ. This is also a story about people, real people, who lived then. I'm going to tell you especially about a dozen people who are forever part of this historical account. It's ironic that Jesus was a Jew born to parents who were both Jews, yet it ultimately was the Jewish leaders who would have Jesus executed. They would do it because He claimed to be the long-expected Messiah, the Savior sent from God. We're going to start with Lazarus. Lazarus was a close friend of Jesus. Lazarus lived with his two sisters outside of Jerusalem in a town called Bethany, about two miles from Jerusalem. Jesus and Lazarus were close friends. Martha, one of the sisters, sent word to Jesus that Lazarus was sick. Jesus waited a couple of days. He told His followers, His closest friends, who were called His disciples or His apostles, He said, Lazarus is is dying and uh, I need to go to him. But He waited. He waited two days. Now, it was a two-day journey to get to Jerusalem or to Bethany, rather, where He was. So it was four days. There were four days before Jesus got there, knowing that Lazarus would be dead when he got there. Got there and said to Martha, I want you to roll back the stone over the the mouth of the tomb. Uncover the grave. Martha said, you don't want to do that, Jesus, because uh, he's begun decomposition, the the body. You you don't want to do that. And Jesus said, yes, I do uncover the grave. And so she gave signal and, and, and they did. And you could see people gasping. You could see them covering their noses. And it was important. It was important that people knew that Lazarus was already dead. And Jesus then prayed a brief prayer. Father, I know that you hear me always, but because of those people who stand by, I'm saying it, that they may believe. And then he said a remarkable thing. He, he said, Lazarus, Come forth. And you see in that tomb, that, that corpse, that body, and it, and it starts to move. And, and the legs are thrown over to the floor, and, and he gets up, and he comes out, and he's alive again. It was, it was a remarkable miracle, a, a dramatic ex, experience of, of the power of Jesus Christ. Now, that's not all it was, though. There were some Jews there who were very close to the enemies of Jesus the chief priests, the the power structure that was for the Jews at that time. And these men run right back to those. You've got to understand that a great miracle has been performed by this Jesus. I mean, people were there. People know about this. It's going to be big. And they were were shaken. It wasn't that they denied the miracle. They they believed that Jesus, they knew about the power of Jesus. It wasn't that they denied it. it. It was that, what do we do now? because they reasoned that that if we let this man go on, he's going to take away our place and our nation. Bear in mind that the Jews right now are under the oppressive thumb of the Romans. They bitterly resent the Romans, these foreigners on their native soil in Jerusalem, but they're there. And you look around the street corners and you see Roman soldiers around. And they don't want to shake things up. And, and they're afraid that if more people, more and more people, follow Jesus Christ, there are going to be problems besides that. But besides that, 
the Jewish leaders wanted to be the power structure among the Jews. And, and people were leaving them to follow Jesus. This notable miracle, the raising of Lazarus from the dead, was going to reverberate. The high priest that year was a man named Caiaphas. And Caiaphas reasoned this way. He said, you're not thinking. It's appropriate that one man should die and not that we should lose the whole nation. Now, wait a minute. Think about that. What that does is, is set the stage for the execution of Jesus. And, and you don't even have to really convict him of anything. The fact is that they, they now take on this logic of Caiaphas, that, that this is going to be the right thing to do for the nation. We will execute him to save the Jews. It was about time for the Jewish Passover. Now, this Passover annual feast was something begun 1,500 years ago by the Almighty God. It was a deliverance, and it involved animal sacrifice, the sacrifice of thousands of lambs, lambs without spot or without blemish. People would bring them. Normally, there would be 50,000 people in Jerusalem. During the Passover feast, that number swelled to three times that much. The bleating of the animals, the jostling of the crowds, the stench of, of blood, and the constant swilling of water made this ritual noisy and exhausting. You look at the priests wearing their white robes, but this day they were drenched in blood, the blood of the animal sacrifices. And Jesus wanted to eat the Passover with his closest associates, his friends called the apostles, the disciples. And so he sent a couple of them and said, I want you to go to Jerusalem into town and I want you to prepare the Passover. And the Son of Man is going to be delivered up to be crucified. Now you get this, this sense that, that Jesus knows. I mean, it hasn't happened yet. He just knows what's, what's going to happen. He knows the future and it's going to include his crucifixion. He's going into Jerusalem, putting his head in the lion's mouth. And now let me introduce to you a man named Judas. One of Jesus' apostles, the closest associates, followers, and there are 12 of them, is named Judas Iscariot. Something has happened to Judas. He was, he was trustworthy at some point. He was, he was appreciated and loved by his contemporaries, the followers of Jesus, but some, something has changed inside of him. And Judas sneaks away and goes to the enemies of Jesus, the chief priests, and he says, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? What if I find a time when he's out of the crowd and you could get him? What would you be willing to pay for that? I guess they were shocked at first to, to realize that, that one of the closest associates of Jesus was the one who was offering to sell, to, to betray him. But they were glad and they agreed. They negotiate. I don't know how you negotiate for the for the Son of God, but, but they do, and, and they agree on 30 pieces of silver. They put it into his hands, and he tells them he'll let them know, and he leaves. There's a, there's a certain vulnerability to friendship and to love, and it, it exists in families, it exists in marriage, it exists among friends, and that's what makes this betrayal so very bitter is that there was a trust there in this friendship between Jesus and his disciples, his 12 closest disciples. And, and Judas exploited that. Now it was time for the Passover feast for Jesus and the 12. And Jesus said, I, I've, I've really been looking forward to this. And then he said, one of you will betray me. Now that was kind of interesting. I mean, what happened next? Because the disciples obviously believe that Jesus knows them better than they know themselves because they start asking Him, one at the time, Lord, is it I? I mean, they, know, they know their own hearts. They, they, know they, they know they would never, they would never do something like that. But He said so, and so they, they grant Him, maybe He does know something I don't know about. The, Lord, is it I? And then there was Judas, Judas, who already had, already had begun his betrayal. And Judas said to Jesus, is it I, Lord? There was an exchange between Jesus and Judas at that moment that the other people didn't get. They, they didn't hear, but Jesus confirmed to him that he knew. Jesus leans over to him and quietly says, what you do, do quickly. 
like a fish released back into the water. Judas takes off to go back. And what he's going to do is to tell those enemies of Jesus that, that Jesus and his associates are headed to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus loved to go there with them. It was a, it was a beautiful place, and that would be the place where they could capture this Jesus. But before the Passover feast was finished with his disciples, he took the, the cup from which he was drinking, and he started setting up a memorial for his death. Now, this is interesting to me because because Jesus wanted a memorial for after he was gone, something that they could look at and remember him by. But it wasn't going to be made out of stone or, or, or metal. Some, it wasn't going to be a statue somewhere. I'm, I'm glad for that. I, I, I don't live in Jerusalem. And, and imagine having to travel so far to, to be able to, to have this memorial place for Jesus. But that's not what he did. And in fact, he set up something that was so easy, so practical that, that people of all nations can and have done it for a couple of thousand years now. He took some of the bread. Now, this is the Passover feast. So the only bread that's available there is unleavened bread. That, that is to say, it has no yeast in it. He said, I, I, want, I want you to eat this. And he prayed and gave thanks for it, and he gave it to them. And he said, this is like my body. And, and then he took a cup that had grape juice in it, and he, and he gave thanks for it, and he said, now you take this and, and drink it. And when you drink it, I want you to think of my blood. It was, it was, it was, it was profound, the, the very idea that he was setting up his own memorial, and he wasn't, he wasn't dead yet. But, but he set up something that could be perennial, that could be perpetual for all time, and that believers in him could, could practice and, and could remember. And then he said this, this night, all of you are going to stumble because of me. But after I've been raised, that is from the dead, I will go and go to Galilee, and I'll meet you in Galilee. Peter was indignant. P Peter said, well, Lord, no, no listen, I tell you, Lord, I I'm ready to go with you to prison, and I would die for you. I I'm, not going, I'm not going to run from you. And Jesus said, Peter, before this night is over, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Peter, Peter was speechless. He, he didn't believe it was true. He was willing to do whatever was necessary. But Peter didn't, didn't know how, how this was going to turn out. And so Jesus then walks with his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane over the brook of Kidron into this beautiful garden. But it's nighttime now. It's dark and Jesus is thinking about what's about to happen. Fascinating that he knows the future before it occurs, but he knows. It troubles me to think that Jesus probably had seen many crucifixions before. And if you ever saw one, the thought of it would, would just terrify you. And Jesus has his disciples, apostles to stay there. And he says, now I'm going to go a little farther. And, and he goes and he falls down and he begins to pray. Not, not just any prayer, but he starts to sweat. History says it was sweat drops like blood. I'm telling you that he was so filled with this anxiety, the, the agony of what was about to happen. And, and, he, and it was cold out there. It was nighttime and it was cold, but, but he was sweating like drops of blood. And he prays and he says, Father, if, uh, if, there's, if there's any way that this could be avoided, I, I, I want to not do this. But then he quickly added, not, not, not my will, but, but thine be done. I know what is right is your will, and that's what I want to do. And then you look, and, and from where Jesus is sitting, you see some lights. You see torches and lanterns. It's a group of, of people coming. And the, the closer they get, you get to where you could start making them out. And, and, and you realize that they're carrying weapons. They're, they're carrying swords and spears. And... And then this striking thing is that the one who is in the lead of them is, is Judas. He has a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And it's, it's, you can see, you can see that Andrew, Andrew, look at that. You know, that's Judas. And suddenly the pieces come together. Jesus said that one of them would betray him. And now they know who. And Judas, Judas is cool. And he walks up to identify Jesus to those officers, and he, and he does so with, with a kiss, and he says, 
Hello, teacher. Jesus said to the group, who are you seeking? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, well, I'm him. Let the rest of these people go. And Peter, Peter, Peter was ready for a fight, and he pulled out his weapon, his sword. I don't, I don't know if he was a good shot or a bad shot. I, I, I can't imagine that he really intended to do what he did, but, but he maybe aiming for this man's hand ahead, he brings the sword down, and he cuts off the ear of a man named Malchus. And Jesus said, stop it. Wait, 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 stop. And he takes the ear, and he, and he reattaches it. This is, this is fascinating to me because... How in the world these soldiers are going to be able to take him away to try him and to crucify him after viewing what was a remarkable supernatural act? Jesus said, Peter, don't you know that if I wanted to, I could call 12 legions of angels to my assistance? Now, a legion is, um, well, a Roman legion is 6,000. Six I mean, you, you, you take that number and Jesus is saying, don't you know that I, I could call 72,000? I, I suppose one angel would be enough to just take this all over. There was an army of angels waiting for the word of Jesus. And Peter said, I don't need your sword. Put it up. This, this is something that has to happen. They tie his hands. I suppose they're going to do several things through this that... that that symbolically try to trump up the idea, to present the idea that Jesus was somebody who was, who was dangerous. So they, they tied him. And they take him first to Annas. Now Annas is the, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who is the high priest that year. And Annas was the high priest before this. And he thought he would get a little time with Jesus. And so the, the trial, the Jewish trial begins. Now, in any kind of a reasonable trial, of course, the, the defendant is presumed to be innocent until proven guilty. Basic legal ethics based on the spirit of fairness say that you try a man, you listen to the testimony, but all through the trial he's presumed to be innocent until he's declared to be guilty. But that, that wasn't true this time. Anna says, so tell us of your teachings. And Jesus, Jesus said, I, I didn't do this in a corner somewhere. What I taught, I taught publicly. Ask, ask your own people what I've taught, at which time an officer standing there slapped Jesus. And Jesus turned to him and, and felt it, and he said, if I've said something wrong, put it in the form of a charge and charge me. But if I haven't done anything wrong, why did you slap me? Well, time was getting away, and they took Jesus then to Caiaphas. Now, Caiaphas is the big guy. Caiaphas is the, is the, is the high priest that year. He is the, the leader of the Sanhedrin Council. This is the high court of justice, the supreme court of the Jews. Seventy-one members. They have legislative, executive, and judicial powers. They constituted the national parliament, parliament of the Jews. Now, there was no appeal. I, I mean, this was the highest court. This is as far as it goes. Once convicted, no appeal. Their authority was supreme. But, but this was conducted at night. What was happening here was all wrong. It, it was all wrong. It said something about the heart of the, the present Sanhedrin. The, the law of the Sanhedrin was being transgressed. The law said a capital offense must be tried during the day and suspended at night. But, but they were doing this at night. And the reason is this was the window of opportunity. They were afraid that if they didn't do it now, they would not get another chance to crucify Jesus. They've got to kill him somehow. The Talmud stated the Sanhedrin was, was to set from the close of the morning sacrifice to the time of the evening sacrifice. But they, they chose to overlook that, and they're trying him in the night. So Caiaphas, all you hear a room full of men, 71, all the Sanhedrin assembled here in the night, and they've got Jesus bound there to try him. And, a preliminary thing, he's going around the room trying to find people who will raise accusation against Jesus. Now, what can you say against him? And they have a lot. A lot of them would say, I, I could say this. I could say this. The problem was that, that their testimony disagreed. He knew that this wasn't going to hold up. This was going to be ridiculous. And finally, just out of frustration, Caiaphas whirls about and, and shouts to Jesus, 
I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus affirmed it. It is as you say. He, he is the Son of God. And, and they kind of came apart. They, this, this impressive judicial court, they go crazy. What, what do you say? They say he's worthy of death. And they begin to, they begin to spit on him. And they, some of them would beat him with their hands. They would get behind him and they would smack him. And, and they, would, they would mock him and say, prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one that struck you? It has begun. Now, outside the hearing, you find one of the apostles, one of the closest associates of Jesus, this one named Peter. He's in a position where he, could, he can see Jesus. I, I don't know, through, maybe through a door or through a window. He can see Jesus, and Jesus can see him. But he doesn't want to be observed because if he's identified as being one of Jesus' followers, I mean, the, he's standing there by a fire, and the ones who kindled the fire are officers, presumably the officers who brought Jesus, who, who, who arrested Jesus in the garden, who bound him and brought him. If Peter is recognized as being one of the followers, it could be, well, very dangerous. And so Peter is taking a low profile, warming himself by the fire and by other people. Well, a young girl comes up and says, I know you. I, haven't I seen you with him? Peter says, no. <laughs> no, I, I don't have anything. Well, why? No, I have nothing to do with him. But it wasn't long before another came and said, I think I saw you with him. I think you're one of these men. And Peter denies it again. It's not true. Would you just leave me alone? It's not true. I have nothing to do with him. And then a little time passes, and it happens the third time. And uh, the climate was so fearful, the terror, the, what could happen if people identified him. And this time Peter denied. The person said, you, I, I know that you've been with him because your speech betrays you. You sound like they talk. And, and Peter says, I do not know him. And Peter emphasizes it with a... Uh, with a curse. It was probably the greatest test of his whole life, and, and he failed it. And, and Peter looks, his eyes glance over to where Jesus is, and Jesus looks at him at the same time, and there's just that moment when, when Peter knows that Jesus was right, that, that, that Jesus had said he would betray him or, or he would deny him. And, and then the, the rooster crows. And it all comes back that Jesus had said, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And that's exactly what Peter did. And he, Peter ran and, and found a quiet place, and he just, he just cried like a baby. Now, do you remember Judas? Back to Judas. Now, I want you to think about something. A man's guilty conscience can be a powerful, overwhelming choking thing. And that's what's happening to Judas. That money, those 30 pieces of silver, it, it turns radioactive. It's, it's hot in his pocket and, and he, he doesn't want it anymore. And, and so he goes back to the temple where these same men are and, and he says, look, I, I was wrong about this whole thing. I, I've betrayed innocent blood. I'm telling you, he's not guilty. He's innocent and I, I was wrong about this. It was all wrong and I want to reverse the deal. And they laugh at him. You, look, that doesn't matter to us. We have no interest in reversing anything. It's already begun. Don't you understand? We don't care about you, and we don't care about the money. And, and he, he takes it, and he throws it down at their feet, and he runs. And he runs till he finds a length of rope, and he fashions it, and he puts it about his neck, and he takes his own life. And thus the book of Judas is forever closed. And we, we're left to wonder about his motive. Why would he do this? Why? I, I suppose that all sin against God is confusing, really. And, and that confusion, that, that unreasonableness of sin is compounded by the greatness of the guilt and the smallness of the motive. And here is Judas, an apostle, 
a close friend, a close follower, of, one who has an intimate friendship with, with Jesus the Christ, who would betray him. And, and we speculate about, about the motive. Maybe, maybe it was just plain greed. I mean, after all, he comes to the, the, the chief priests and he says, what will you give me and how will, I will deliver him to you. Maybe, maybe it was fear. I mean, Judas was the treasurer of the group, indicating they, they must have trusted him. And history says that sometimes he was taking a little money out of the bag for himself. He was pilfering, stealing some of the money. I wonder, you know, you know how this can happen. I mean, maybe, maybe he was financially strapped short one day and, and he thinks, well, I'm going to be paid next Monday. I, I could just borrow a, a little of the money out. No, nobody's going to know it. I'm not stealing it. I'm, I'm going to put it back. I, I'm just going to use it for, for a little. Well, so Monday comes and he doesn't get paid like he anticipated. And, and he can't put it back. And, and then it happens again and perhaps again and before long. He, he, he doesn't like to be around Jesus. He doesn't like to be around the other disciples because he wonders what, what they're thinking. And maybe they know. Perhaps, perhaps it was guilt. Some even speculate that, that it was political, that his motivation was political, that, that in his mind, Jesus was, was going too slow about destroying the Romans. Remember, these are Jews, and, and they hate having the Romans in Jerusalem. They hate the rule of these Romans, and they want them out of the way. And, and maybe, maybe what Judas thought was, if I press Jesus into a position where they could kill him, that he will use his supernatural, miraculous abilities, and he'll just, just wipe out the Romans. And maybe, maybe it was because, because he felt he was doing something good for his people. I, I, I don't know. I don't suppose I'm going to know, because Judas' life is ended at his own hand. Now back to Jesus. They take him then to Pilate, to the Praetorium, which is the governor's palace and the place where court is often held. Now, it's early morning. They had to wait until dawn to do this, and so the sun is starting to come up. It's still chilly outside, and they come to the Praetorium, but they don't go in. They want to send him in. They don't want to go into a Gentile court because it would defile them. They were willing to execute the Son of God, but they didn't want to go into the Gentile house. Then Pilate says, what's this all about? And, and they said, well, we, we want you to sign a death warrant. Well, well uh, what are the charges? He, they said, look, Pilate, we wouldn't have brought him to you if it, if it wasn't something bad. Can't we just get this done? Pilate said, then judge him yourself. They said, we can't. You know we can't. We, we want him to be executed, and we don't have the authority to do that without your permission. You've got to sign on to this. And so Pilate goes in to talk to Jesus. Now, Pilate was not a man that you would have admired. He wasn't a good man. One author said of him, Rome may have granted Pilate the right to govern, but he was never able to establish order in Judea. His judgments were often rash and thoughtless and incompetent and cruel. A contemporary of Pilate, a Jewish philosopher named Philo, spoke of Pilate's vanility, his violence, his thefts, his assaults, his abusive behavior, his frequent executions of untried prisoners, and his endless savage ferocity. Pilate knew that he would lose his job or perhaps his life if he didn't keep the Jews pacified, and he was afraid that a riot was going to happen. So here is Jesus. Here is this Sanhedrin. And, and, they, and they want blood. So the Jews said, we can't do this. It's not lawful for us to try him. It's not awful, lawful for us to convict him and then carry out a sentence of death. Therefore, the Jews said to him, it's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. All right, all right, we'll give charges then, they thought, to the Romans that will please the Romans. Here they are. Now, he is perverting the nation, forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar. And he says that he himself is Christ, a king. Now, what they're trying to do is to trump up the idea that, that he's guilty of inciting treason. Caesar is king. And so he, Pilate comes to Jesus, 
inside the praetorium and he says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, are you saying this of yourself or did someone tell you this? In other words, he's saying, Pilate, if this is hearsay, why are you trying me? In other words, is this, is this reasonable that you would ask me this? And Jesus, I think Jesus is trying to appeal to Pilate's conscience. Jesus said, Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. There's logic attached to that. In other words, Pilate, it doesn't make any sense that I'm their king and they're bringing me to you for crucifixion. Do you see me as a leader who poses a threat to anybody? Jesus said, the people who listen to my voice believe the truth. And Pilate paused and said, what is truth? From the ivory palaces of the wealthy to the ghettos that line the streets of cities today, people are asking the same question, you know. And, and many are denying that there's anything universal about truth, no universal truth, no absolute truth. But Jesus defined it as those people who listen to Him. And He goes back out and He says, He's innocent. There's nothing, there's nothing worthy of death in this man. He's, he's innocent. But, but, but they wouldn't hear that. And the, the screams, the shouts are louder. And He knows that a riot is about to occur. And, and His position will be in jeopardy if that happens. But He has this idea. He says, uh, you know, this is Passover time, and I always, I always let the Jews have back a prisoner that we have incarcerated, somebody that, that, that they feel we shouldn't have imprisoned. This year we'll make it different. So he says to one of his partners there, he says, uh, who do we have incarcerated of the Jews that's the, that's the worst? Who do we have that they hate the most? Well, his name was Barabbas. Barabbas was a bad guy. He was... He was a murderer. He was guilty of insurrection. He, he had incited rioting. He, he, was, he was a thief. He was a terrible man. And he says, Pilate says, go get him. Bring him. And so they bring him. And you can, you can hear the jeers of the people. The, maybe Barabbas cursed them as he was, it was, he was brought out. And, and Pilate stands Barabbas and Jesus side by side. And this was his attempt because he doesn't want to convict this innocent man. And he says... It is our custom to release a prisoner to you at the Passover. This year, you must choose which, Barabbas or this Jesus who is called Christ. He knows they're not going to let Barabbas come in and threaten their families and their children. And He knows what's going to happen, but he was wrong about it. He was mistaken because what happens is they say, release Barabbas. Release Barabbas? Well, what, then, what would you have me do then with Jesus? And they said, crucify him. I'm telling you, the hatred that they had for Jesus is amazing. About that time, Pilate's wife comes to him and she says, Pilate, listen, I don't want you to have anything to do with this just man. I have, I have suffered many things in a dream because of him. He's a good man. Don't you do anything against this just man. Pilate, Pilate has some conscience about him, but, but, he, but he's persuaded by what's happening. The riot is going to happen, and besides that, they could, they could go and, and, and tell people that he was not loyal to Caesar because this Jesus professes to be a king, and it's just a mess. And here's what Pilate does. He, he goes to a basin of water where everybody can see him, and he begins to wash his hands, and he says, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. In other words, I will grant you the permission to execute this innocent man, but just for the record, I want everybody to know that I think he's innocent. Pilate compromised. Pilate, Pilate knowingly condemns Jesus. And the first thing that must happen is the scourging. Pilate releases Jesus to the garrison, to the soldiers. Now, I don't think the soldiers know Jesus. If they've ever heard of Him, it would be a scant knowledge. They don't know much about Jesus, but what's about to happen is going to take your breath away. The first thing that happens is a scourging. So Pilate dispatches a centurion 
to handle the whole matter of the scourging, the crucifixion, all the things relative to it. Now, a centurion is a Roman military commander over 100 men. Now, a legion contained 6,000 men. Those were divided into 10 battalions, making 600 men per battalion, and each of these was divided by six, thus 100 men. Centurions were in charge of the soldiers or centuries. A centurion was in charge of 100 men, and they were in charge of all things, of training, of drilling, of inspecting, of making sure they were fed and clothed, and he was the boss of 100. So a centurion is selected. Pilate dispatches him to take care of this. Now, Roman soldiers were trained to be, to be hardened. One of my friends wrote this, in the Roman mind, the legionary, Roman soldier, was a tool, a machine. Though it possessed dignity and honor, it abandoned its will to its commander. It ate and drank only in order to function. It required no pleasure. This machine would feel nothing and flinch from nothing. Being such a machine, the soldier would neither feel cruelty nor mercy. He would kill simply because he was ordered, totally devoid of passion. He could not be accused of enjoying violence and indulging in cruelty. Far more was, his was a form of civilized violence. The Roman legionary must have been one of, one of the most horrifying sights, by far more horrific than the savage barbarian. For if the barbarian simply knew no better, the Roman legionary was an ice-cold, calculating, and utterly ruthless killing machine. Totally, he was totally different from the barbarian. His strength lay in that he hated violence, but he possessed such total self-control that he could force himself not to care. Now, crucifixion was preceded by a scourging with a, a whip. It was... It was a whip with several leather lashes, and in the ends of the lashes were tied bits of bone or of glass in order to inflict as much damage as possible. The scourging was sort of a mini-death. It, it was to, to bring the, the condemned man right up to death without accomplishing it because that was reserved for the cross. The whole garrison was around Jesus participating in this. They stripped off all of his clothes, and somebody thought of the idea of, I mean, they had heard that he claimed to be the, the, the king of the Jews. So they put a, a scarlet robe on him. That was all he was wearing. And somebody had this, this bright idea of going out to a thorn bush and, and gingerly cutting off links of, of these long thorns and weaving it carefully into a, a circle because they were going to mock him as a king and, and, and force this down on his head. And then they, they, they bow to him and they spit on him and they strike him on the head with a stick and they say, Hail, King of the Jews. And all this happens before the cross. And I know it's confusing. And, and to American minds, it's very confusing because while we practice capital punishment, we go to great lengths to make sure that the victim is treated very civilly and that the suffering is very minimal, but not so with the Romans. And you might wonder why. You might wonder, was it because they just enjoyed inflicting pain? Was that, that, that's not, I don't think that was the reason at all. I don't think they knew Jesus or cared about Jesus. But bear in mind, their, their objective was utter humiliation. Their objective was that, that people who saw what was happening would be brought into submission, a hanging or a beheading, Wouldn't, an instant death where you, you just carried a man to the outside the city and you killed him and you, you disposed of the body. It wouldn't accomplish all their purpose. So what they did was to strip a man naked. They, they made him a public spectacle. His accusers would gather around him and laugh at him and mock him as he struggled to breathe. No proper burial. Most of the time, most of the time they would leave the victim on the cross and, until he decayed. They wanted to dishonor the dead in order to, to control the people, in order that other Jews, when hearing an instruction by the Romans, would be quick to obey. They would never question the authority of the Romans out of utter fear that what they had seen happening to others might one day happen to them. 
and they led him away to crucify him. Pilate saw Jesus before they led him away, and he was covered in blood. Maybe, I, I suppose, the, the crown of thorns still on his head. But wait a minute. He says, wait a minute. Bring him over here. And, and he was pitiful. He, he was just pitiful. And, and Pilate stands there beside him, and there's, there's the angry mob, and, and Pilate says, behold the man. I don't find any fault in him. In other words, I want you to look. Isn't this enough? And I know that you're mad. I know that you hate him. But isn't it? Doesn't this suffice? And and it didn't. When somebody cries out, "If you don't crucify him, you're no friend of Caesar's." Well, that that put the mat over. And Pilate delivered him to be crucified. But he did this one last thing. He, he had a plaque made that said in three languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, the King of the Jews. It was purely symbolic, and it doesn't make any difference because he's condemning him to death. I want you to always remember, you must always remember that good thoughts, good intentions are not the same thing as right actions. It's symbolism without substance. Pilate had a conscience, yet he forever serves as an example of weak leadership and a violation of conscience. Please remember, power and greatness are not the same thing. They make Jesus carry His own cross, and while we don't know the route through the city, it goes through the city some way to Golgotha. On the way, apparently Jesus, unable to bear up under the weight and all of the blood loss that He has sustained, uh, apparently can't carry the cross anymore, and they just grab a man out of the crowd who is identified in history as Simon of Cyrene and have him carry it. And they go to Golgotha. Now, crucifixion is, as you would understand, created to be uh, one of the most painful executions imaginable. And, and when, you, when you think about crucifixion, perhaps you have a picture in your mind at the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, thousands of Jews were crucified. One historian, Seneca the Younger, uh, talked about how the, the Roman soldiers got a little bored with crucifying men the same way. Sometimes they would attach them to trees, or sometimes they would attach them to buildings, sides of buildings. But anyway, he talks about, uh, about the variety of ways just for entertainment that they would start crucifying different ones. And sometimes he said they would crucify them upside down. Sometimes they would impale them through their private parts. Sometimes they would crucify them in the shape of an X or a Y. After 100 AD, history always indicates that Jesus was crucified on a cross that was shaped like a tree. They would, or like a T rather, and they, they would have dug a hole and, and attached him with nails to the cross, going through his hands and through his feet, and they would have put the, the end of the cross by a hole that they had dug, and they would hoist up the cross and then drop it down into the hole. Now, typically we think about the cross being up high. I, I doubt that was the case. One, one writer suggests that only a few inches was necessary beneath the, the feet of the condemned man so that the people who were at the foot of the cross could have perhaps looked at Jesus almost eye to eye. And Jesus, seeing all the commotion and now the cross being set in the ground, said, Father, forgive them. He's praying to the Almighty God. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now, I want you to try to picture the atmosphere at the cross. At the same time Jesus is crucified, there are two others, both of them thieves, convicted thieves. Nobody seems to care much about them. They deserve what they're getting. And, and Jesus is sandwiched in between those two. I, I expect that was in order to give the appearance that here you have three men being crucified, three men that we've convicted, three men deserving of death, that maybe, maybe some of this guilt would be implied on Jesus. And then the, the people in front of the cross, some of, some of them are these Jewish leaders, these, these dignified men of the Sanhedrin, but they're not dignified today. They're mocking Him, and they're, and they're wagging their heads, and they're saying things like this, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Or, 
He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he's the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross. If he does, we'll believe him. Or he trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he'll, if he'll have him. For he said, I'm the son of God. And Jesus, hanging on the cross, was listening and watching. And then you look at the, the foot of the cross there, and, and there are others there. And some are sympathetic to Jesus. You have some of the women who are followers of Jesus. And John, one of his apostles, is there. And, um, and his mother's there. Mary, his mother. And you, you have trouble believing that. I, I think that she couldn't stand to be there, and she couldn't stand not to be there. And Naturally, we assume that the others aren't there because of the danger, but Mary wasn't concerned about that. Jesus is her son. She doesn't care about the danger. He's her son. Kipling wrote, If I were hanged on the highest hill, O mother of mine, O mother of mine, I know whose love would follow me still, mother of mine, O mother of mine. If I were drowned in the deepest sea, mother of mine, O mother of mine, I know whose tears would come down to me, mother of mine, oh, mother of mine. I heard of a court case one time in which a mother and her child were drowned. And, and nobody was, no witnesses, nobody saw it, but, but the case was over an inheritance, and the division of an inheritance hinged on who died first. And so, because there were no witnesses, the judge was merely going to have to, to, to make a ruling. And, and so, the judge finally said this, the mother died first. I know that is the case because with the last bit of energy that she had, she would have held her child up above the water. It's a, it's a mother's love. and Mary is standing watching her son being crucified. What do you suppose is going through her mind? What do you suppose she's thinking? Maybe, maybe she's thinking about how she first felt on the day she was told by an angel of God that she was going to have a baby. Remember, she was just so shocked by it. She said, I don't, I don't see how this can be. You understand that I've never been with a man. And she hadn't. You, you think that she taught, or th thought about there at the cross about how it felt to have him growing in her womb. Does your mother sometimes talk about when she was carrying you and about when you were, my mother does. My, my mother talks about it. Maybe she thought about how it felt to have him moving in her womb or maybe turning the pages of her memory. Maybe she thought about the first glimpse of his little face, of his fingers, of her, maybe those tiny tears on his cheeks. She was his mother. How she felt about him was different. I mean, she, she nursed him at her breast. Maybe she thought about Jesus as a boy when he was 12 years old and how that his Knowledge of the Word of God, of the Scriptures, was remarkable. And, and how, how that he would, would talk to the, the doctors of the law in, in a way that was intelligent. And he would ask questions and they would, they would find it fascinating. Maybe, maybe there at the foot of the cross she remembered about his first miracle. That was, she was involved in that, you know. I mean, it, it, was, it was at a, a marriage feast at Cana of Galilee. And and Mary was apparently one of the hostesses. I don't know if she was kin to the person. I, I don't know, but, but she was there and she was busy and Jesus was there and things were happy. But Mary comes to Jesus, her son, and she said, Jesus, we're all out of grape juice and, and I don't know what we're going to do. You, you need to do something. I, I, I don't know if she, I suppose she knew that he had the ability to perform miracles and I don't know, she puts it on him. Now, an interesting thing happens because Jesus seems like he's saying no to her, but she takes it as a yes. Jesus' response was, what have I to do with you, woman? And Mary says to the servants, whatever he tells you to do, you do it. She took it as a yes. How do you explain that? Well, I, I, think, I think if you heard the inflection of his voice and, and saw it, I wouldn't be a bit surprised, but what he winked and smiled at her, what have I to do with you, woman? And she knew that he, he was going to help her, and he turned water, a large quantity of water, into the sweetest wine, the juice that you ever tasted. Maybe now at the foot of the cross, she thinks about what would a mother think about? But then this happens. Now remember that Jesus was crucified about 9 o'clock in the morning, and he's going to stay on the cross for six hours. 
we get close to noon now. He's been on there about three hours. A thief on every side. Now, I know that the crosses on either side were not very far away from him because they're able to have a conversation. And at some point, the, one of the thieves says to Jesus, Look, if you really are, if you really are the Son of God, could you, just, could you just get us down from here? And apparently it was in a mocking tone because the other thief starts to rebuke him. And, and he says, Look, don't, don't talk to him like that. You know that we're here because we deserve it. We're here because we committed the crimes, but he hasn't done anything wrong. He's innocent. And then this man turns to Jesus, this, this one who was speaking, turns to Jesus and he says, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus turns to him and says, Today you're going to be with me in paradise. Paradise is a cross on the other side. It's the realm of departed spirits, a place of bliss. I want to ask you a question. Is this life all there is? Or, or is there a life beyond this one? That thief that day believed there was a life beyond this one. And Jesus confirmed that it was true. And Jesus, who is able to forgive sins, said, Today you're going to be with me in a place of bliss. Very shortly thereafter, a remarkable thing happened. Darkness. Well, you say, what's the big deal? It's dark. Oh, go ahead. It gets dark every night. No, it's not night. It's, it's not night. That's not even close to nighttime. It's noon. It's noontime. And a hard darkness falls all over the earth. And you can't explain it. You say, well, maybe it's an eclipse. Yeah, but how long does an eclipse last? 15 minutes? This is going to last for hours. But I know, you know, it was, it was the sun refusing to shine on its naked creator, writhing in agony and in the deeper anguish of his soul. It was a tribute of nature to a dying Savior. And when the sixth hour was completed, Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he said, it is finished, and he breathed his last. Now, at that time, and bear in mind that it's still dark, three o'clock in the afternoon, and, and it's still dark, so it's troubling. And the centurion, remember we talked about the Roman soldiers and the centurion, the hard as nails man, the centurion. He's standing there making sure everything is done appropriately for the Romans. And when Jesus died, the earth began to quake. I know, I know there are earthquakes, but, but it happened at the moment that Jesus died. At the moment He died, the earth, and it's a significant earthquake, and, and rocks are dispatched from mountains. There's, it's a loud thing, and it shakes, and it stops. And, and the centurion standing there facing Jesus, who is now dead, says, Truly, this was the Son of God. Pilate had acquitted him three or four times. Others had said, he's, he's innocent. And now this, this Roman centurion, charged with the responsibility of making sure that he was executed, claims him to be innocent. Joseph of Arimathea, a good man, and a, another good man named Nicodemus, who loved Jesus, followed Jesus, they go to Pilate and they say, he's dead, you know. Pilate turns to his soldier there, and he says, did you check and see if he was dead? And the response was, yes, he's quite dead. After we believed him to be dead, I took my spear and I, I put it into his side. Now the reason for that, I assume, was to pierce the heart. I expect that soldier knew that there were questions about this man and about maybe even that he had said he was going to rise from the dead. He was going to make sure he was dead. And so just as an assurance of that, after Jesus really was dead, he, he put the spear into him. Yes, Pilate, I can guarantee you he's dead. Pilate says, I, look, I don't care. And he says to Nicodemus and to Joseph, you, you can take the body. I, I, he's dead. I don't care. Go ahead. And, and so they do. They, they take the body and they wrap it in linen. And some of the ladies are getting some spices together to treat the body. 
but the chief priests and the Pharisees, the, the ones who instigated this crucifixion to begin with, they follow up and they come to Pilate. Look, Pilate, now you know that this deceiver, before he was crucified, said that he was going to, he was going to be killed, but that he was going to rise from the dead the third day. We can't let the disciples of Jesus come and steal the body away and then perpetuate this hoax that he really is alive after he's dead. Now, I want you to remember that they didn't suggest that he wasn't dead. They knew he was dead. They just didn't want anybody to, to lie about him being alive again. And Pilate said, fine, fine. You could send your soldiers to the tomb and you can make it as sure as you can. Go ahead. Pilate was sick of the whole thing. And so they did. Yet the most important matter for the human race isn't that Jesus died. It's about what's going to happen next. I'll talk about that in part two of this presentation.